All right. Well, welcome everybody and uh, good afternoon and, or good evening, depending on where everyone is located today. Thank you for joining us for this workshop on demystifying bioinformatics as a tool to teach modern genetics and genomics presented by my colleagues and I from the Jackson Laboratory. Um, I just wanted to put out a quick reminder that this uh, Zoom session is being recorded and is going to be added to the on-demand on library as part of the NABT 2020 conference. So just a reminder about, about recording. So for today's session, this is our agenda for, uh, for today's workshop. We'll, we'll do some brief introductions and give you a, a brief history of the Jackson Laboratory and our teacher professional development program. We'll have an introduction to bioinformatics, and then we'll take you through a demonstration of a couple of, of our bioinformatics lessons and activities that we have developed for use um, with high school students to teach them about um, modern genetics and genomics. And then we'll finish up with uh, a quick review of some of the resources available through the Jackson Laboratory, and we'll open things up for a Q&A at the end. Um, hopefully all of you received an email from me yesterday afternoon with a box link um, to a folder that contains all of the handouts for today's session. You don't need to have the, the handouts in front of you for the session, but if you, um, if you wanted to look at them um, while we're going through the session and follow along, that um, you're certainly welcome to do so. Um, we also included in that box folder, um, in addition to the, the handouts of the lessons and activities that we will be demoing, we included a copy of the, the slide presentation. So you don't feel like you need to write down anything that you're, that you're seeing on the slides. The slides are included in there. Um, and also, I just wanted to let you know that we we have reserved time at the end of the session for Q and A, and we uh, will open things up for um, a broader discussion at the end. But if you think of a question that comes up as we're going through the presentation, you know, do feel free to drop that into the chat, and one of us will be monitoring the chat, and we'll be sure to um, address that question um, before we close the workshop this afternoon. So we'll start off with some uh, quick introductions. Um, I'll introduce myself first. My name is Sarah Wojcicki, and I am the Director of Education at the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine, which is our research campus located in Farmington, Connecticut. Um, and I came to the Jackson Laboratory after spending time first as a high school biology teacher and then as a biology professor. Um, at two primarily undergraduate teaching institutions um, with a, a strong passion and interest in teaching uh, genetics and genomics to young students. And so I'm really excited to be part of the Jackson Laboratory team that provides um, this type of training for high school students and their teachers. I'll turn it over to Emily to introduce herself. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everybody. My name is Emily Pietsu. I'm a genomics educator at the Bar Harbor campus of the Jackson Laboratory in Maine. I have my PhD in genetics and genomics. I received that from the Univer University of Connecticut. Um, my role on the education team involves a variety of teaching and educational outreach efforts in genomics topics, usually. Um, one of my favorite projects to work on is the Teaching the Genome Generation Program. You're gonna hear about that a little bit more and course development and public outreach. And Christina. Hi, everyone. My name is Christina Valianatos. I also work as a genomics educator, um, but I work on the Farmington, Connecticut campus. And uh, my work focuses on the development and implementation of educational programming in genetics, genomics, and computational techniques, mainly at the high school and undergraduate levels. Um, so I came to education from a background in science and bench research. So it was during my PhD uh, in human genetics at the University of Michigan when I would try to explain to my family and my friends about my experiments and what I would do in lab all day that I discovered that there's a huge disconnect between scientists and the community. So I became really driven to bridge that gap and 
I pursued a lot of science communication and education efforts. And I especially wanted to share how science impacts real life and the career possibilities um, with students who are the next generation of STEM professionals. You know, many of us come to science and medicine wanting to help people. And I found that I could do that not only in research, but also through educational efforts. So I made the jump after my PhD and I've um, been at JAX for just over a year now. Um, and it's really a, a great place to work. It has the unique, for me, a unique ability to specialize in genetics education to match my expertise from grad school and my degree in genetics, but also to be in an environment where there's cutting edge research just down the hall. So I hope you enjoy our presentation today and look forward to engaging with everyone later in the session. All right, thanks, Emily and Christina. Um, I just want to introduce, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with the Jackson Laboratory, I just want to give a brief in introduction as to what we're all about and tell you a little bit about um, our education program in high school teacher professional development. The Jackson Laboratory was founded in 1929 in Bar Harbor, Maine. Our main campus sits on the border of Acadia National Park. It's a very uh, beautiful location. And we subsequently opened a second research campus in Farmington, Connecticut. Um, the laboratory is focused on genetics and genomics research, and our mission, as shown on the slide here, is um, to discover the precise genomic solutions for disease and empower the global biomedical community in the shared quest to improve human health. And one thing that I um, really love about working at the Jackson Laboratory is that we have a, a great dedicated team um, in our education department that provides uh, genetics and genomics education and training to a wide variety of learner groups ranging from high school students all the way through to postdoctoral research fellows. And the program that we're um, going to talk to you a little bit more about today is our high school teacher professional development program called Teaching the Genome Generation or TTGG for short. So the goal of TTGG is really it's based upon the, the foundational principle of human genetics and we really um, or human uh, variation in human genetics and we really want to celebrate that variation that we see in human populations through education about modern genetics and genomics. We have three elements to our teaching the genome generation curriculum. We have um, a molecular biology component uh, to, the, to the curriculum, which is actually a series of laboratory protocols that take students through the genotyping process of a select number of genes that we have, um, we have uh, been working with over the past several years. So teaching students about DNA extraction, PCR, gel electrophoresis, and how to analyze that data in order to determine specific uh, genotypes for those human genes. We also have a bioinformatics component to the curriculum as well. And so this component of the curriculum is, is what we're gonna be focusing on in today's workshop. And so you'll learn a little bit more about some of the activities and lessons that we have um, in that arena in just a moment. And then we also um, couple the, the molecular biology and bioinformatics components with a bioethics component of the curriculum. And this bioethics component is through a collaboration with um, our partners at Harvard University in the Personal Genetics Education Project, or PGED. And so we have robust um, lab, uh, ethics discussions about the genet um, the genetic testing and um, genetic research and how that impacts um, society and what are some of those ethical controversies and ethical implications of genetic testing and genetic research. The Teaching the Genome Generation program is funded by a Science Education Partnership Award through the National Institutes of Health. Uh, since 2015, TTGG has worked with close to 200 teachers across 17 states. Our campuses are again in Connecticut and Maine, so we have primarily been focused on the New England area, um, but we have been broadening our scope over the years. Over 14,000 students so far have um, experienced elements of our curriculum, and we're looking forward to expanding upon that in the coming years. 
So as I mentioned um, briefly before, our, the focus of today's session is going to be on the bioinformatics arm of our curriculum. And so for this next section, I'm going to turn things over to Christina, who's going to give a basic introduction to what bioinformatics is all about. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so in this part of the webinar, I'm going to provide a brief intro to bioinformatics and why this is in a biology classroom and what skills students can develop by doing these types of exercises. So this may be a review for many of you since you chose to come to this session, but I think it's important to make sure that we're all on the same page and to also talk about what your students can get out of learning bioinformatics that they can carry with them beyond the classroom. So what is bioinformatics? Informatics is a more general term. We hear that all the time now in this era of big data that we're in. It's the study of natural and engineered computational systems. It's the process of transformation of information, basically. And I think this is a staggering figure. According to IBM, 2.5 million terabytes of data are generated every day. So for context, the average modern computer holds one terabyte of data. All of our tweets, news articles, health records, location tracking, et cetera, it's all data, right? So about 90% of that data that exists has been generated in the past two years alone. So it's no wonder fields like computer science and technology have really taken off. Informatics has come to biology as well. So bioinformatics is an interdisciplinary field that develops methods and software tools for understanding the biological data, especially when data sets are large and complex. So that's particularly true in genetics and genomics with advances in sequencing technology. So if you think about our human genomes, each cell contains 6 billion letters of our genetic code. So just in one cell, any study looking at DNA or RNA from a human or model organism requires a ton of computational power to handle that kind of information processing. So bioinformaticians are important for making sense of that data, drawing relevant conclusions to fuel discoveries. So to illustrate just how critical this field is to the forefront of human health, uh, the National Institutes of Health has a genetics office, the National Human Genome Research Institute, which recently released their strategic vision for modern genetics and genomics and human health. And so I'm showing here one of their figures, they're depicting how basic genetics research cycle, which is on the left, feeds into the clinical and healthcare system, which is on the right and vice versa. So data management, including storage, sharing of information across collaborating scientific bodies and data analysis with the latest tools and technologies, all of these things are critically important, just as are doing experiments and medical practices. So what does bioinformatics work look like? It can really be as complex as coding or using and designing algorithms, machine learning and art artificial intelligence, um, or it can be as simple as using tools like databases or doing very simple comparisons. So some examples I'm listing here include uh, modeling, like disease modeling in a pop population under different circumstances. Um, for genetics, annotation of sequence data for DNA or RNA or proteins, and then linking that with related information about gene structure and function, um, maybe protein expression, relationship to disease, that kind of thing. Even calculating ancestry from your favorite at-home testing company or a disease risk based on a clinical mutation screen, and so much more. So there's really a whole spectrum of applications out there. And we really want to illustrate with um, the lessons that we provide here that this does not have to be scary. I know a lot of biologists sometimes like the, you know, bio side, the squishy things and the computer things are um, just very different. And so really these bioinformatics lessons, like the ones we offer through TTGG, the Teaching the Genome Generation, they give students the opportunity to discover and use publicly available online databases to just dip their toe into this exciting field and give them the confidence to dive deeper should they choose to. So we also want to take a moment to emphasize how many aspects of learning bioinformatics align with both science and math standards. So for example, our lessons draw on specific life science standards about heredity, DNA, and chromosomes, since the focus is on genetics, you can see they go beyond the biology and get into questioning and reasoning, claim and evidence, even statistics and probability. So they tie really nicely into math standards. It's a very clear relationship. 
And this helps to reinforce skills that they're getting in other courses and vice versa. So bioinformatics reinforces the universal transferable skills, including obtaining, evaluating, communicating information, searching for reliable data, thinking about assumptions and approximations when making inferences. Um, students can take these skills with them when they leave your classroom. And the truth is that many of you will have students who are just not jazzed about science or biology, and this may be their last biology or science class before entering their adult, adult life. But the skills that they can learn in your courses are still integral to navigating life, to understanding a doctor's report about the risk of developing cancer based on family history, or to understanding the importance of evidence, data, and observations when drawing conclusions. And for those students who will stay in STEM, quantitative skills are a demonstrated area of weakness currently. So receiving this type of training early in their STEM career journey can really give them a strong advantage later on. Bioinformatics also fits a variety of learning and working styles. So those on the autism spectrum may find that they thrive with systematic methodical tasks of programming and data analysis. Also, this work can be done solo or as part of a larger team effort. And perhaps you don't enjoy lab work, or maybe you're unable to do work in a lab due to your own accessibility issues or, you know, a global pandemic where you have to be remote. So bioinformatics means that you just need a computer and the internet and you can do your work from anywhere, anytime. So science is increasingly becoming interdisciplinary and developing these types of transferable skills can open doors to more career opportunities across a number of sectors. So I hope this gives you a nice flavor of what bioinformatics is, and I'm going to turn it over now to Emily to dive into our first lesson. Awesome. Thank you so much, Christina, for that great introduction on bioinformatics. So let's um, try out one of these lessons that Christina was mentioning, the second bullet point there, one that's as simple as checking out an online database and making some comparisons. So that is what we're going to check out now. This is one of our TTGG lessons. It's called Jump into Bioinformatics, also called Wiki versus OMIM exercise. And I wanted to first mention that this can be done as an interactive class lesson, but it can also be done asynchronously as a remote one. So especially now, uh, we wanted to remind you guys that this is available. We've provided it to you today, but it's also available online at jax.org. So this lesson is designed to guide students to learn more about various sources of online human genetic information. So today we're gonna get a little sense of this exercise and we'll go through it together and compare information presented about a specific genetic disease found on a commonly used resource website with information found on a publicly available bioinformatic database. And then through our comparison, we'll evaluate the best use for each platform in the pursuit of un understanding a genetic disease. All right, let's jump in now. Okay, so OMIM might be something you're unfamiliar with if you're not um, from the biomedical research community, but it's a really cool online publicly available database. OMIM actually stands for Online Mendelian Inheritance in Man. And it's a really awesome tool compiled by genetic and genomic professionals at the Johns Hopkins University. It's basically this online comprehensive database or catalog that has all of the different genetic mutations that have occurred in known genetic disorders. So it's really a amazing tool and it's pretty widely used um, in the research community, but um, not really used outside. So in this lesson, we're gonna learn how OMIM can provide a unique kind of uh, angle to learn details about a specific disease and the genotype that underlies it. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention about OMIM is that it contains full text articles and we'll get a look at those in a minute. Um, but these span over 15,000 genes and Currently, there's about 25,000 different entries in OMIM. So um, let's get started on the exercise together. If you guys are able to, um, if you're on a desktop computer or if you have another screen, you can follow along. But if you don't, don't worry about it. I'll be able to show you the screen simulation as we go. So in the classroom exercise that we've designed, students are guided to choose a disease from the list below. 
it can be a really great way to start students on a research project for a genetic or genomic disease. Um, but today for the walkthrough, let's focus on Charcot-Marie-Tooth disease. Okay, so to get started, let's try out the first part of the search. So if you guys are able to open um, a browser and search Wikipedia, which is um, a commonly used, freely available search tool, and search for Charcot-Marie tooth disease. Um, and if you are able to do so and throw in the chat, um, maybe the reading level and perhaps what kinds of information are presented about the disease there. So maybe we can just take one or two minutes um, and try to do that ourselves, and then we can review what we find. Okay, um, is anybody able to pull up the Wikipedia page on Charcot-Marie tooth disease and see any um, maybe details, any sort of contents that might be on that page? Okay, um, well, let's go on to the next slide and take a look at the screenshot. If you were to do the search, what it would look like. So this is the result page. If you type in Charcot-Marie tooth disease on Wikipedia, and you can see there's this kind of broad overview of the disease. There's a picture describing uh, the phenotype. There's also a section on signs and symptoms, causes, the diagnosis, management, prognosis, and history of the disease. So it's definitely got quite a bit of information here. Um, and the reading level, um, maybe we could say is high school level, something around there. Um, we have short sentences that are um, you know, in structure, not with a ton of jargon. Um, so those are some basic observations that I can make about this Wikipedia results page. So maybe we can do um, an OMIM search and then compare the two. Okay, so let's check out OMIM's ability to directly search for a disease or phenotype to uncover ge the genes that are associated with it. So let's try the same thing, Charcot-Marie tooth disease, but this time we'll pop it into OMIM. Okay, so if you were to do so, you can see um, this page and it's a little bit, um, you know, different looking than Wikipedia, but you can see our first hit number one there has a specific number in front of it, and then Charcot-Marie tooth disease dominant intermediate B, C-M-T-D-I-B. So that is a specific OMIM entry. And OMIM basically has a specific entry for each basically version of the disease. So it's, you see there's many different entries for Charcot-Marie tooth disease, and that's because it's genetically heterogeneous. There's multiple different genes that can be mutated to form this disease. So for the purposes of this example, let's click on the first one and check it out. Okay, so here's an example of a OMIM entry. So we can look at the phenotype gene relationship table, which I've squared out in blue. And we can see that there's two distinct phenotypes that are listed here, an axonal type 2M and a dominant intermediate B. And they're listed together here within the same entry because they're both caused by a different genetic change, but they're within the same gene. So they get grouped together on the OMIM results page. So on the left side, you can see the table of contents, kind of similar to the Wikipedia search page, um, has title, description, clinical features, mapping, molecular genetics, a little bit different details, but similar structure. So let's examine this entry a little bit more and see the kind of information that is contained. 
Okay, so if we were to actually zoom and click on the molecular genetics section, you can see that there are in-text citations and quite a bit of um, you know, references that are cited in text. And all of these references are listed at the end of the OMIM entry. And it, it actually links out to peer reviewed citations of primary literature. So this is an amazing tool if you're trying to find the fundamental primary research articles that genetic or genomic uh, disease research is based on. Okay, so to wrap up, let's do a, a little comparison. Let's actually do the wiki versus OMIM um, ourselves. Okay, so on the left side here, we've got uh, Wikipedia and some of its features. So Wikipedia is an online encyclopedia, but we know that it's updated by volunteers. So not necessarily professionals in the scientific community, but because of that, we're actually able to gather quite a bit of broad information about the disease. There are primary literature citations sometimes, um, but the genetic information tends to be pretty brief. And Wikipedia can be really great to start to learn about a disease for the first time. OMIM, on the other hand, is an online catalog of human genetic disorders curated by experts. We saw those full rich text descriptions and cited, cited to the peer reviewed literature directly. And OMIM can basically be your one-stop shop for discovering the details about human genetic diseases. So if you really wanna dive deep into the details of a specific human disease, OMIM's a great place to go. Okay, well, I hope you guys um, got to see how straightforward and fun being a bioinformatician can be. Data science is as simple, it can be as simple as using an online database and websites, just as in this exercise. And this lesson can be really engaging and rewarding and allow students to learn something new about the details of a human genetic disease that they care about. Bioinformatics can be really fun for students who enjoy finding patterns and working on puzzles. So I hope you had fun trying out yourself and thank you for your time. All right, thank you, Emily. So. Um, so that was sort of our, the wiki versus omen exercise is sort of our entry level introduction to bioinformatics. Um, in the remainder of our session today, I'm going to highlight some elements of a second lesson that we have developed that goes into a little bit of a deeper dive on some of our bioinformatics databases and tools. And this particular lesson was developed using a case study approach where we actually built in the bioinformatics activities around a story. And we published this story uh, through the National Center for Case Study Teaching in Science, and it's called Solving a Medical Mystery with Bioinformatics. The case is provided in the handouts that we um, provided in the box link. Um, and you can also navigate to the National Center for Case Study Teaching and Science and download the case directly from there, along with the teaching notes and the answer key if you have a subscription to um, NCCSTS. If you're not familiar with um, NCCSTS, it is a peer reviewed repository of um, thousands of case studies that have been developed over many years in a variety of different um, science disciplines. This case study that we wrote is actually um, the, based upon a true story. So Dr. James Lupsky is a real person. Um, he's a geneticist at Baylor College of Medicine, and he suffers from a neurological condition that was running in his family. So he and his siblings all had the same condition. So as a geneticist, it didn't take much for him to, to recognize that there had to be some sort of genetic underpinning to his disease. And so what he actually ended up doing is sequencing his own genome. And through that sequence analysis, he was able to determine the causative mutation that led to his disease. And it turns out that he has Charcot-Marie tooth disease and, um, and he discovered the mutation in a specific gene that is contributing to that disease. These are the learning objectives for the case study. The case study is um, an interrupted case with multiple parts to it. However, you do have the opportunity to um, pick and choose sections that you would like to, to do and you don't have to complete the whole thing and certainly not in one sitting. 
Um, and it, it really would just depends on what elements of the, of the bioinformatics analysis you'd like to focus on. For the purpose of today's session, we're really just going to focus on these two um, objectives here in using a bioinformatics database to investigate a genetic disease and obtain information about a specific gene involved in a, in a hereditary disease. And then using how to use a genome browser to view sequence alignments between different species to look for genetic similarities and differences to assess um, the validity of animal models of human diseases. So where we're going to be focusing our efforts in, in today's session is really in parts three and four of the case study, if you're following along at home. Um, but I just wanted to provide a brief synopsis of what happens in the first two parts of the case. So this, as the story goes, the students take on the role of Dr. Lepsky's uh, family physician. And basically in, in the first part of the case, we are introduced to Dr. Lepsky, we determine what his symptoms are. And then in an exercise that's very similar to what Emily just went through with our in Wiki versus OMIM activity, um, the students have the opportunity to explore Wikipedia and OMIM to try and diagnose the cause of the disease. And it's determined that Dr. Lepsky has Charcot-Marie tooth disease based on, um, on those searches. In the second part of the case study, the students read uh, an article from the New York Times that talks about Dr. Lepsky's sequencing of his own genome. And it describes um, how he discovered the actual mutation in the gene SH3TC2, which is causing his Charcot-Marie tooth disease. So we're going to pick up at, um, at part three of the case study. And in this part of the case, we decide to take a deeper dive to understand a little bit more about this gene, SH3TC2, and its potential contribution to Charcot-Marie tooth disease. And we're going to do this by exploring a particular um, gene database that is available through the NCBI. NCBI stands for the National Center for Biotechnology Information. It's a government-based um, database. And so if you use the URL that's in the case study to navigate to the NCBI gene database, this is what the landing page looks like right here. And so if we wanted to find out some more information about a specific gene that we know is contributing to a, a, a human disease, we could type in the name of the gene into the search field here and click search. So in typing in SH3TC2, we are taken to the specific gene entry within the NCBI database. This is a screenshot of um, what the top of that page looks like. And the page is admittedly chock full of information. It's got several sections to it. You, through it, you can scroll up and down and see a lot of, um, of very detailed information. And um, so part of, part of you know, sort of learning how to become a bioinformatician is actually training yourself to be able to you know, extract information from a page that maybe looks very busy and very overwhelming. So looking for specific cues like, like headings and subheadings to help identify information. And so based on the navigation to this NCBI um, gene entry page, the case study asks for some basic information about the gene just to help students understand a little bit more about what this gene is all about. And what you'll discover in looking at those questions is that really all of the responses to those questions can be extracted right from this summary portion of the NCBI gene page. So we can you know, figure out the, full, the official full name of the gene. We can find out um, you know, whether or not it's a protein coding gene, and we can determine if it is um, associated with any diseases. And so if we look at, uh, look close, more closely at this particular summary, it, um, it points out to us that this gene has been implicated in a specific type of Charcot-Marie tooth disease, um, in particular type 4C. So you'll recall when Emily was going through the OMIM entry for Charcot-Marie tooth that there were all of those subtypes of the disease listed um, when the search was completed. And so this particular uh, gene mutation is associated with one specific subtype of Charcot-Marie tooth. 
The case study then goes on and actually from this particular NCBI um, database page, you can actually link back to the OMIM entry for Charcot Marie Tooth Disease Type 4C. And the case study um, asks students to do that where they can learn a little bit more information about that human disease and about some of the research that is being done, again, referencing those primary literature articles um, to learn more about this particular form of Charcot Marie Tooth Disease. But we're going. We're not going to dive into that um, into that portion of the case study since Emily reviewed the OMIM database uh, with you previously. So instead, we're going to jump into um, part four of the case study. So in the third part, when the students examine the OMIM website, one of the things that they will discover by looking at the OMIM entry for Charcot Marie Tooth Type Four C is that there is actually a mouse model for this disease. So there has been um, a mouse generated that has the analogous mutation to the mouse version of SH3TC2. And so in this stage of the case study, the students are really looking at genetic connections across species. And the big picture questions we're, we're getting at here is, you know, how valid is a mouse model of a human disease and how valid is this specific model for Charcot Marie tooth disease? Um, and one of the mechanisms or one of the ways by which we can try to address these questions is by looking at the genetic con conservation between the mouse and the human version of the gene. One of the ways that we can examine this genetic conservation is by actually comparing the DNA sequences between the two species using a genome browser. And in this particular case study, the genome browser that we're using is Ensemble. Um, so the URL for the Ensemble genome browser is, um, is listed right in the case study. If you were to navigate to ensemble.org, this is what the home page uh, looks like for this uh, genome browser. And so again, we're interested in examining the SH3TC2 gene in humans and comparing it to other species. So we're gonna start off by um, navigating to the, the human uh, DNA sequences. And so if we click on our favorite genome as humans, it takes us to a search engine where we can actually search for specific human genes um, based uh, in the human genome. And so we can type in SH3TC2 here and hit go. And it gives us, lo and behold, a bunch of entries for SH3TC2, the human gene. And so you'll see this huge list of, of entries here. And what you're actually seeing are a variety of different um, transcript versions of this particular gene, SH3TC2. So there's alternative um, transcripts that get generated um, via alternative splicing that make these different versions of the gene. However, if we look at this very first entry, this demonstrates to us that this is the reference genomic record for SH3TC2. So this represents the full, um, the full gene sequence. And so this would be the very first entry would be the, gene, the entry that we would um, want to click on. So if we, to, if we were to click on the, the first entry here, this takes us to the, the gene entry page for SH3TC2 in humans. And again, it's a lot of information. A lot of this information is very similar to the information you can find at the NCBI uh, database that we were just looking at. But one of the, um, one of the unique and um, handy things that we can do in the Ensemble uh, database is we can actually look at the sequence of this particular gene and we can compare it to sequence, the same sequence in other species. And the way that we do that is by looking on this left-hand menu um, under this heading called comparative genomics. So comparing the genomes of different species. And in particular, clicking on this um, entry called orthologs. So orthologs are genes from different species who um, that have evolved from a common ancestor. And so they imply that they have you know, similar structure and function in organisms um, you know, as they have gone through that evolutionary process. And they usually retain a similar function in similar expression profile in the species that they're, um, 
that they're located in. So we're interested in examining the orthologs of SH3 TC2 that are present in other species besides humans. So we would click on orthologs. And when we do that, we are basically given a huge data dump of all of the different orthologs that are, that are out there of this particular gene. And there are a lot of them and they are grouped here by species. So you can see there are 26 primate, um, different primate species that have an ortholog um, and placental mammals, fish, you know, all sorts, hundreds upon hundreds of different species. But we're interested in comparison in comparing mice and humans, because again, we want to examine the validity of this mouse model. And so what we would do is we'll check this box for rodents and related species, and that will just refine the search down to just the species that fall into that um, into that species set. So once we click on rodents and related species, it will just show us the available orthologs from species within that group. And lo and behold, there is our common mouse, which has the scientific name Mus musculus. So this is the gene, and um, this is the gene entry for um, for the mouse version of SH3 TC2. And if we want to compare the sequences, there's an option here where we can view the sequence alignments. So this will allow us to compare the human and the mouse sequence. When we click on view sequence alignments, a pop-up window appears and it gives us the option to either view the protein alignment where we can look at the actual amino acid sequence between the two species, or we can look at the cDNA alignment. And this, the cDNA alignment is just the, is the complementary DNA sequence of the messenger RNA for the transcript that's created from this gene. In the case study, um, the students would actually get the opportunity to examine both alignments. Um, for our purposes today, we're just going to take a look at the cDNA alignment. So if we click on the cDNA, cDNA alignment, here we actually get to see the sequence alignments. So here we're, we're looking at the actual sequence of the, the cDNA for the human version of the, gene, of the gene shown on top. Here's our start codon. And then it would go, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom, you would find your stop codon. The bottom sequence is the mouse sequence. And then this bottom line here with these um, asterisks, these indicate um, the positions within the, within the sequence that are identical between the two species. So if you just take a quick look anywhere where there's a star, you see that the that the nucleotides are identical between the two um, the two sequences. But where there isn't a star, you'll see that there is a, a substitution that is made. And so you can take a quick scan at the page and say, yeah, there's a lot of stars here. So there's you know there's quite a bit of similarity between these two sequences. But if you look at the top of the page you will actually be given the, the data that tells you what percentage of the sequence is identical. And so that's referred to as the percent identity. So at the top of the, this page here, we see that 82% of the, the nucleotides are completely identical by position between the mouse and the human sequence for this specific gene. So doing this type of sequence alignment, you know, provides you the opportunity for, you know, a deeper discussion as to how to interpret this, this type of data. You know, what does this information mean? So what exactly is genetic identity? And, you know, does this represent a good enough amount of genetic conservation to make it a useful model? Is an 82% similarity enough of a similarity between two different genes um, from two different species to make it a worthwhile model to use to study a, a particular human gene or human disease? Or are there potentially better, better models out there? So students can go back and they can look at other species and they can do other sequence alignments to see if there are others that have a, a greater percent identity or a, a lower percent identity. And 
they will certainly find, particularly in the primate species, that there are definitely going to be um, sequence comparisons where the percent identity is much greater. But does that necessarily mean that those primate species, such as chimpanzees, would make a better, better model to study the disease? So it gets into those discussions of you know, what makes a good model of a human disease and what value can an animal model bring to genetic research. So these uh, two vignettes of our of these two exercises, I hope, have provided you just a, a, a glimpse at some of the bioinformatics opportunities that you can bring into your classroom to integrate the discussion about genetics and genomics and the contribution to human disease um, without necessarily doing the laboratory techniques, but looking at it through a more um, sequence comparison and sequence examination approach. I just wanted to spend a couple of minutes um, talking about some of the resources that we have available through the Jackson Laboratory before you, um, before we open things up to a question and answer period. So I would invite all of you to um, learn more about the Teaching the Genome Generation program by visiting our website, which is jax.org slash ttgg. Um, on our page, we have um, a lot of information about our program. We run an in-person short course. Um, we have links to a variety of genetics and genomics learning resources that we have available. Um, but what I really wanted to point out for everybody is a brand new program that we have um, just rolled out, which is, uh, which is our online teacher professional development program. So we have just launched a free self-paced online course that teaches um, how to implement our three-part curriculum examining human variation in a specific gene um, known as ACE. Not to be confused with ACE2, which everybody is, is learning about and reading about in, in examining the molecular biology of the coronavirus. This is just a screenshot of our, um, of our homepage for our online course. The online course is broken into modules, so um, you can, again, proceed at your, at your own pace. We integrate information about the, the gene itself that's being examined, the, some bioethics um, analysis, and then getting into some of the laboratory techniques that you can use with your students as well. This um, diagram shows an overview of the different modules that we have. Again, it's a three component curriculum that incorporates labs, bioethics, and bioinformatics approaches. So we integrate this into a, um, a sequence of lessons and activities that provide a broad, um, a broad overview of this ACE gene and the variation that one can observe among humans in this particular gene. Um, within the online uh, uh, teacher professional development course, we have video tutorials and demonstrations of how to conduct the laboratory protocols if you were to, to use the labs with your students. Um, we have video tutorials and exercises about bioinformatics. And then we have um, a variety of activities around things like interpreting gels. And these are um, interactive practice activities to help you in analyzing what real ACE uh, genotyping gels would look like um, if you were to run them in the lab. The course also includes knowledge check questions and planning assignments that give you the opportunity to think about how you could use the curriculum in your classroom. And at the conclusion of the course, it, it does provide you the opportunity to earn a certificate and badge for completion of the course. So with that, I would love to, um, you know, I thank you so much for your time today and we would love to open things up. We'll, we'll stop sharing the slides and so we can see more people on the screen. Please feel free to turn on cameras and microphones and ask questions directly. Or if you want to type a question into the chat, we would love to address any questions that you might have. So um, we did get one question uh, from Christina here that is asking if we can see the mutation uh, when we do these types of ser searches. So I just wanted to address that, um, that in the resource that Sarah showed, 
when you do pull out that DNA sequence from the gene that you're looking at, that's from a reference human sequence. So it should contain the canonical nucleotide, kind of the most common normal <laughs> nucleotide that's, that's there. Um, and so if you know your mutation and where it's located in the sequence, you can find that corresponding nucleotide or amino acid, depending on if you're looking at the DNA or protein sequence and see what the canonical is and then see you know, you know what your mutation is, so you can make that comparison. Um, but there are other databases that um, do show human mutations in genes. Um, so I listed one in the chat when I replied to this, it's called NOMAD, it's from the Broad Institute. And so that um, allows you to do a similar gene search. And it also shows all the mutations that are known in that gene. Um, you can see mutation frequency. So it's really interesting to see like, what's a common mutation? Because not all mutations are bad. This is just, you know, human variation. We have mutations all over genes that are um, not causing anything harmful, and some are disease causing. So you can see what are the rare ones, et cetera. Um, so there are different databases out there. So Sam, uh, Sam asked another question. Uh, are the TTGG ACE student materials also available in this online platform, and can they be copied directly to an existing Canvas course. Um, well, good news is that the online um, professional development is in Canvas, so everything is ready to, to transfer over for you, I guess. Um, fits your, your school platform just perfectly. Um, so all of our protocols have a teacher version and a student version. Um, or most of them do. So usually the student version might have um, just fewer details on, you know, some of the background information and just have sections for notes and, um, you know, places to, to do work, um, things like that. And so um, everything is available on there. And we do have some of these that are available on our TTGG website that's separate from the professional development program. We, we do share our lessons, the teacher versions, um, publicly, and then if you take the, the PD, the free PD program, um, you'll get kind of in-depth training on all of that. Looks like there's a question on um, what level is this designed for? So yeah, that's a great question. And I, you know, our curriculum is, you know, bro very broadly focused towards um, the high school level. And we've had teachers really use the curriculum at all levels. So we have teachers using it with introductory biology students. Some AP instructors are using it with their AP classes. We've had teachers in, you know, with honors biology sections. And then also we have um, several teachers who use this in elective courses that they have developed in biotechnology or in genetics or allied health. So I think it, you know, it's the the curriculum can be very very adaptable for you know different levels depending on on your students. So Beth asks the question. Uh, she's looking for pointers, um, maybe tutorials for using the Thousand Genome Browser. Um, so Beth is experienced in genome browsers, it seems like. So this is a great one. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, the One Thousand Genomes Project started as a project to just do just that, collect 1,000 genomes from people um, ac across the globe. And I think it's surpassed that um, at this point. But uh, again, trying to capture human genetic variation. And um, so I think you can really take model off of some of the exercises we showed you here, like, um, for example, the, the solving a medical mystery. And instead of searching NCBI, um, or the ensemble databases, you can use the 1000 genomes. And so if you pick a, a gene that you are interested in, um, you can just look maybe at some of the sequence and how it varies across different po populations around the world. So you can do something uh, really similar. I just have I don't one know thing if Sarah, to add. Emily have suggestions. Emily. Yeah, I, I, I popped it in the chat. There's a link from the International Genome Sampling Resource. Um, they basically provide a series of slides covering the history of the Thousand Genomes Project, um, the raw data that's available, how to use the actual browser, and then they actually have written up um, a couple different exercises about how to use the website and the browser, and then um, you know viewing the actual file. So depending on the level of, um, I guess, the students. 
yeah, so Beth is saying that they teach sophomore level genetics course. Yeah, I think this would be definitely appropriate and you could adapt to that level and find some cool yeah, things. Yeah, absolutely. Places. Anybody have any other questions they'd like to ask? Has anyone struggled with integrating bioinformatics in their biology classes? <laughs> it's definitely not easy. And, um, you know, maybe you get the, the pushback. Why do I have to learn this? I'm in biology. <laughs> yeah, in our personal experience, we, you know, we definitely feel that this is the of the three elements of our curriculum, the labs, the bioethics and the bioinformatics, this is definitely the hardest one to, to execute. But, you know, as Christina alluded to earlier in, in the session, you know, it's so important, you know, particularly for students who, you know, have any interest in in pursuing a, a STEM career in the future, or maybe are thinking about becoming a STEM major. Um, you know, there's just this need for having a greater understanding of of how to use a lot of these resources and to do this type of analysis and um, you know biology and computer science are just becoming so much more and more integrated these days. Um, you know we have graduate students that we work with here at the Jackson Laboratory who come in and you know don't know how to to do any of the the sequence analysis or, the, or anything like that and they're really at a disadvantage and have a steep learning curve and so the earlier we can get students you know thinking about how to use these tools and just you know taking away that sort of stigma and fear of of um, what bioinformatics is all about uh, the better Yeah, Heather provides some words of encouragement that it's easier for students now and it might be difficult, but it's worth the effort. Um, and I just, you know, just want to put out there for anybody who's, you know, who's in this call, um, you know, please do feel free to contact us. I put our, our broad um, TTGG email into the, into the slide presentation, which everybody has access to. Um, if you want to use any ele elements of our curriculum, if you um, are interested in our teacher professional development program, please don't hesitate to, to reach out. If you're exploring ways to incorporate bioinformatics into your classroom and want to have like a deeper discussion about how to do this specifically with your class or your, your, your students, um, we would love to chat. So, um, so if you want um, to take some time uh, after this uh, session, at some point down the road, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out. We'd love to collaborate with with any of you. I really appreciate this comment from Rivka that their students struggle with visualizing what's shown on a browser and the understanding of the molecular nature of a gene is weak. Yeah, that's a really hard thing to conceptualize sometimes, you know, depending, you know, you see the DNA double helix and then what, you know, what is a gene, you know, how is that fitting in here and then how does that correspond to all these ACTGs I'm seeing in this database and what's what is going on <laughs> so I totally get it um, hopefully these types of exercises help to again just dip the toe become a little bit more familiar and start to start to process that information like Sarah said when you get to that search engine page and you just see all the entries you don't shut down and say oh I, I don't know what this means you can at least say okay Let's start at the summary. Let's tackle it. And then if you can, you know, start there and say, oh, this says chromosome five. Oh, that's what that stick is. <laughs> that must be chromosome five. And this little portion highlighted, oh, that, that must be the gene. So hopefully these are like baby steps using these just to help that, that struggle with um, visualizing because it's, it's true that, you know, structure function relationship and just the hierarchy of, of levels of organization from the you know, two strands of DNA all the way to, to chromosomes. It's it's a hard thing to, to conceptualize. And so it takes time, but doing these things hopefully will help. Um, I just want to take a second to share my screen. Um, somebody had a question about where to find the online professional development course. So can everybody see the screen yes. here that has our, our yeah. Teaching the Genome Generation website? Okay, great. So this is our, our website. It's jacks.org um, jacks slash TTGG. 
And on this page, if you scroll down, there's a section called online professional development. And there's this green button here that says register and learn more. And if you click on that, that this takes you to where you can enroll into that Canvas course for the, um, for the online teacher PD program. I also want to highlight that um, if anyone's on Twitter, this week is Black in Data Week. Um, so there's lots of great threads out there for people of all backgrounds, um, but highlighting Black data scientists and sharing what types of hard and soft skills are important to succeed in data science. So um, be sure to check it out. It's a great resource, especially for aspiring STEM students and anyone interested in data science. So very timely this week that that was happening. Any final questions or comments? Thank you guys for being such an engaged group. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Great questions. Right. And um, it was lovely to be able to present this to you all. And I hope to, I hope that we get to follow up with some of you um, in the future as you take a look at some of these resources. Take care. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye.